you can't bear with me, then we'll pray for patience. <laughs> Come here right away, Emmanuel. What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah, no, sir, it's just confirming that he rotated. Oh, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's good? Sure? sure. You're alive. Now switch it. Is that thing that you go there? I don't know. Oh, yep, wrong way. <laughs> I don't know, bro. I don't know. I just go straight the other way. I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't like this. I'm, I'm just going to click out of it. I'm just going to do this. Go on YouTube Live right away. All right, well, he's doing that. So anyway, a couple quick announcements. What's up, guys? <laughs> you guys are with us as we try new things. Anyways, for those who like the coffee, I said it Sunday. I'm going to say it for the next couple services. Text me before service. Don't text me like two minutes before service is going to start because the answer is no. Text me like 20 or 30 minutes before service starts. If you know you're coming, shoot me a text at like at noon. I don't care. I won't open it until I get to church anyway. Just if you know you're coming and if you want a coffee, I would love to make you coffee. What I wouldn't love to do is be stressed out two minutes before service, scrambling, trying to make you a coffee. I'm more than happy to make anybody a coffee. So don't be like, oh, I don't want to. No, I'm telling you, you could. Just don't do it two minutes before service. So you all have my number. If you don't, my number is easy to get. Ask me. Go on YouTube or Facebook or the website, and it's just there for the whole world to take. So if you want a coffee, ask. But just don't do it before service. Or show up. The best one is show up early and then be like, hey, can I have a coffee? And yes, I'll make you one. But I'm going to stop doing it like right before service because that puts a, ma a massive amount of stress on me because there's more important things that I have to deal with. What does it look like? What does that mean? It's all sideways stupid. All right, I'm just going to go like this. Sorry, guys. This, this stupidness of life. See, we need patience. I need to be the one praying for it. How about Sorry everybody If you're live or whatever Life goes on Be here live and it's not as bad so. Sorry guys I'm waiting for our new computer to get in So we can get rid of these cameras But till then this is where we're at so. Alright so that's what it is <laughs> Alright so anyways So if you want the coffee, please just text me. Um, secondly, we're doing a trunk or treat something. So, again, I know Halloween is, uh, is one of those things where Christians look at it and go, ew, gross. But we're not those Christians because we're not afraid of a holiday. Um, if you guys think witches only come out on October 31st, you are sad. I'm going to share with you how open they are about it. Last Sunday night, we went out. Well, actually, Sunday after the morning service, we drove out and we saw at the corner here a sign that said, Curandera. Call the number, yada, yada, yada. You know what a curandera is, right? It's a witch. It's a witch doctor. That sat really wrong with me. But I let it go because I was tired. I went home. I came back. We did the service. And then I walked out, and there was a sign on this pole right here, on that pole over there, and on the pole back over there. Curandera signs. Witch, witches. Open, blatant. Just, hey, call us. We'll do whatever witch nonsense we'll do for you. So... Don't think that October 31st is the devil's day. The Bible says every day is the Lord's. Now we're going to take that day, we're going to redeem it back, and we're going to use it to witness to people. So if you want to be a part of that, we would love for you to be a part of that. I brought that tub. There's a little tub floating around somewhere with the little pumpkin that I drew on it. I need to get a, a new QR code scanned for it so that if you want to join us for the trunk or treat and dress up your trunk, we would love the help. We also need candy, so if anybody wants to donate candy, please do that. Don't bring open bags of candy because I'll toss them. It has to be fully closed, all closed, none of it opened. Not like each individual candy is open. Whatever bag you bring has to be closed because I want parents to know that whatever we're giving their kids is safe. Um, we're having a baptism. I believe I said the 22nd. It's on that sign-up sheet back there. If anybody wants to get baptized on the Rio Grande River, we're going to do it Sunday the 22nd after church. Please join us. Last announcement is we, two more announcements. The 14th is the women's event. So I've told you guys, it's free, it's great, come join. This women's event is going to be different than the others. Every women's event that you guys have been to has been extraordinarily elegant. 
You walk in and it's like, whoa, this one's not going to be like that. And it's not because we don't want it to be like that. It's because we have like 57 women coming. Now, just so you have an idea, I'm taking the couches out. I'm taking the tables out. And I'm going to pack every single chair I can in here. And we can only fit 59 chairs. It's a small space. And I tried. I was going to go like rent a room at like the embassy suites. But it's like $2,500 for a couple hours. And then another like $2,500 for food. And I'm like, now nah, we're, we're going to squeeze in here. That's what it is. And so... We keep asking, pray, for, pray, guys, that God would open up the doors for us to get a bigger space. It is needed. There's a few spots left. You're welcome to join. You don't have to. It'll be Saturday, September 14th. We have an awesome lineup of speakers, awesome worship. So we got some more worship that's live that's coming in also on top of the songs we're going to do as well as several other live worshipers. So come, join the ladies for a few hours. We're going to have a great lunch. We're going to have great teachings. And it's going to be a time for you ladies to get together, sharpen each other up, and build each other up. And it's going to be marvelous. If you don't come, that's okay. But come. I've never encouraged this, but I'm encouraging you not to invite anybody else. <laughs> we can't, we literally can't fit them. We, they're, they're, if we got about three or four seats, and after that, there's no room, none. So... But you can come. There's enough room for you to come. And if there's anybody that hasn't RSVP'd, there's like three more seats. But after that, that's it. <laughs> there's one seat left. <laughs> and after that, I don't... Who? You better tell her to RSVP. You better, you better hit her up and be like, you make sure though. So anyways, lastly, and then we'll get started, is October 12th. We're going to have a men's event. I got four teachers lined up. We're going to do some worship. Kurt said he'll do it for us. We're going to do some rap songs. I'm going to try to get my boy Ramon up here to do some music. Um, yeah, it's going to be dope. I don't know what kind of food we're going to have, but it's going to be good. It's going to be a few hours long. It's just going to go hard. It's going to be just for the men. And I think we're either going to call it Real Man or Iron Sharpens Iron. I don't know yet. We haven't talked about it. But Sunday we're going to talk about it. So if you're a dude, you know, we've got guys coming finally. You know, Men are stepping up. Come, October 12th, it's a free event. It's going to cost you nothing. Come get some great teaching, some great worship, some great fellowship, and some great food. And if you know, we don't play around with food. That's why I'm fat. <laughs> so it's good food, I promise. Anyways, uh, those are the announcements. Father, we thank you for being God. We thank you for your faithfulness. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would be our teacher, that as we get into your word, that you, Lord, would speak mightily, that your Holy Spirit would move in power. We pray, Father, that we would receive that which you have for us. Break us of ourselves. Help us to hear you through the noise, Lord. We pray that you would fill us with your holy presence. Be magnified in us tonight, Lord. May our attention be fully on you. May you rebuke every distraction, every frustration, anything in this room tonight that's going to keep anyone from hearing what it is that you have for them, what you have for me, Father. Get me out of your way. Get us out of our own ways. And most of all, Father, get us out of your way. Move in might, move in power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Several years back, I did a teaching in Judges chapter 4. And it was, without a doubt, one of the most powerful teachings I've probably ever done. It's, it's the story of Deborah and, and Barak, and it's the story of Jael. And, and God raises up this man to do work. And the man cowers. And he opts out of what God called him to do. And so God raised up two women, essentially, to do the work that God had commanded him to do. And when you get to the end of the chapter, the essence of the chapter was that because Barak stood down and he didn't do what God called him to do, a woman was exalted in his place. Now, I know if you're a feminist, you're like, oh my gosh, you can't say that. In this culture, it was extraordinarily disgraceful that if a woman had to step into your shoes to do the job that you were supposed to do because you weren't able to or you were too cowardly to do. And so this was one of the biggest disgraces on a man's name of that time. And it was solely because Barack refused to do God's will. Now when I did this teaching, again, I put my heart into this. I, I studied my butt off and I presented it on a Sunday night because my pastor used to allow us to teach on Sunday nights in this rotation. And that was the chapter, one of the chapters I was allotted and there must have been about 15 to 20 people in the room. It was a small service. But out of that 15 to 20 people, 7 to 10 of those people rededicated their lives to Christ. 
It was just a powerful teaching. And, you know, whenever, especially if it's a good teaching, I always get attacked. I get attacked viciously. And the enemy comes and starts slurting and, you jacked up, you suck, I can't believe you. And I, in my mind, all these thoughts start protruding. And it's just, it's this noise that it's hard to see past. And in my mind, I'm like, I know I did what was right, Lord. But what if I didn't? And so I'd often go to my pastor and be like, you know, how, was, how did I do? Because, you know, I trusted him to be honest with me. And so I went to him the next morning. I was at the church, and he was there, and, you know, he was in his office. So I said, hey, you know, how are you doing, blah, blah, blah. How did I do last night? You know, I'm just I'm, I'm struggling. And he put down his pan. He leaned back and put his hands on his stomach. He did that. And, yeah, you know. <laughs> and I was like, oh, crap. That's not good. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm like, oh, like, all right, give it to me, bro. He's like, you want the truth? I was like, well, yeah. He says, I don't think you studied. He's like, really? He's like, yeah. Well, why do you say that? I just, I don't think you studied. I think you just winged it. I said, no, I put about 15 hours, 10 to 15 hours. Oh, re- really? Yeah, I studied my butt off for that, man. Well, I couldn't tell. I walked away just devastated, like, oh. So I went and I grabbed the teaching from the, you know, the other CDs and I went and I listened to it. And I listened and I'm just waiting and I'm listening and I, I think I even took some notes on my own teaching. It was just solid and I was like, that was a good teaching. I was like, well, I'll play it back. Maybe, maybe I'm just, you know, let, let me get out of my own way and like maybe I need to just make myself neutral and not look at it like, hey, this is me. Like, what if this was just some random person? So I replayed it with, you know, my mind be reconstructed to... I'm just going to play it like if I didn't know this person. It was just as solid. I think I picked up a few more notes the second time around. And I was like, I don't think I could be objective here. So there was a lady named Trish, Patricia Romero, Chavez. I don't know. She goes by Romero now. And I trust her. I call her Mama Trish. She's, the church, she's where we started the church out of her house in Santa Fe. Now, I love her. I love her so much for several reasons. One, she's so gracious. Two, she'll lynch you lovingly. She'll just lynch you. She just... And it's not meant to hurt you. She's just got that personality. Like She'll be straight. Don't ask her a question you don't want the answer to because she will be straight with you and she will spare your feelings nothing. And so I'm like, if somebody's going to be straight with me, it's going to be her. So I remember, you know, because we're doing the church out of her house on, on, what was it? I think Sunday mornings or Monday nights at that time. We we're doing Monday nights at her house. So I, when I went, I gave her the teaching and I said, I need you to listen to this. She's like, why? I said, I just, I need you to listen and I need you to give me an honest assessment. All right. And she takes the teaching about six days go by and then I get a call from her. She says, so I listened to the teaching and I'm like, oh my Lord. Okay, give it to me. What's up? She said, that was incredible. I said, explain. So she starts trailing all the notes she took and she's like, that's one of the best teachings I've ever heard you do. Why do you ask? And I'm like, ah, crap. I was like, well, I went to the pastor and this is what he told me. And she had said something that I thought but I didn't want to say because I thought it was arrogant. And she says, do you think maybe he was jealous? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. And I stopped there. Because today we're going to see jealousy spike in the nation of Israel between two prominent people. And they're going to look at Moses and they're going to look at him with a burning jealousy because he has something that they don't have and they want it. And we see that happen. We see that happen throughout the Old Testament. We see that happen in the body of Christ today. When somebody has something that we want... And that's okay, you know, I wish I had Kurt's gift. I wish I can sing good and play the guitar. I have my moments where I hit notes and they sound great, and then I have other moments where it sounds like a screeching cat, you know. I can't sing. I can't control my vocals. I am not gifted by the Holy Spirit with that. Do I wish I had that? Yes. So there's nothing wrong with desiring gifts. The problem is when we desire a gift to the point or to the degree that we would desire that the other person would lose it or we would shame them for having the gift that we want. Where we don't allow them to succeed and to soar in the gift that God has given them because of our insecurities and jealousies. Today we're going to see Miriam, Moses' sister, and Aaron, Moses' brother. They're going to approach him and they're going to curse and spurn him because they're jealous. In chapter 12 of Numbers, verse 1, did I tell you guys to open up to Numbers? Numbers, chapter 12. (laughs) 
And you little guys, if you want, you guys can go in the back there or you can hang out out here. But it's way more boring out here. You go back there, it's way cooler. But that's your call. If you want to be up here with the old boring people, all right. But back there, they got games and treats and prizes. And then you're also going to learn about Jesus. So you decide what you guys want to do. And even in the middle of the service, if you want to get up and go, that's okay, all right? You won't bother anybody. But chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And so they come disgruntled. They come jealous. And it says they spoke against Moses. Now, it's important for us to know that in the Hebrew, that word speak against isn't there. The word that is there is they spoke. And the reason that the translators put this front forward that they spoke against Moses is because when we look at the context taking place, that their speaking is in a negative connotation. Their speak, they are speaking against him. Although the Hebrew word doesn't translate that, but the sentence does. The, um, what did I write here? Ah, I guess I put exactly what I said. The context implies it. So in our English translations, it says he spoke against. Now, why did they speak against Moses? It says here they spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. And so they looked to find fault with their brother. And so when they couldn't find fault with Moses, they became petty. And they looked to his wife who was a Cushite woman. Now, I've heard this passage taught. And when this passage was taught, I remember the pastor explicitly making this passage about racism. And he talked about racism and why it's bad and yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, okay, cool. And I, you know, I'm not so sure that's what it's saying, but okay. And when we dig into this, we're going to see it very well could be a racist connotation. Or I believe there's something much deeper here. Now, when we look at the word Kushite, it's an adjective. And the adjective is going to focus on one of two places. Kushite literally means to be black, to be blackened, um, blackness. That's, that's the word of Kushite. And so when they mention that you married a Kushite woman, it's you married a black chick. How could you, Mo? She's black. That could be very well what they are saying. It could be a skin color issue. For this reason, some replace the word Cushite in the scriptures with Ethiopian. So like when we get to Jeremiah 30, does yours say Ethiopian? So some of your translations say Ethiopian. And like when you get to Jeremiah 38, 12, it says Ethiopian. Because Cush or Cushite Literally means black, and so some translators put Ethiopian there. I don't know why. I think, I think that's a bad move. So Cushite is the actual word. Now, there may be a relationship between Cushites and Ethiopians. Very well, maybe. But I don't think that she is an Ethiopian to any degree, and I'm going to tell you why I don't think she's an Ethiopian. Actually, I'm going to tell you how I know for a fact she's not an Ethiopian. Because Zipporah, this is Zipporah, Moses' wife, has a father. You guys remember where Zipporah's father's from? Midian. He's the Midianite priest. Midians lived in the desert of Midian. So I want you to pretend like this is all of Africa, right? You have Egypt up here, Ethiopia down here. There's this really big sea here called the Red Sea. Splits Egypt from Midian into the Arabian Desert. This is where Zipporah and her father and family are from. Ethiopians are way across over here. When Moses fled, he didn't flee Egypt going down. He fled across and over into Midian, into the desert. So she's not an Ethiopian by any means, by any... She's not. So why then do they call her a Cushite? Well, Cushite means blackened, right? Arabs can be very dark. My brother, he's much browner than I am. And if he hangs out in the sun for a good deal of time, he doesn't look Chicano anymore. <laughs> he starts to look black. That's, that's what happens when you spend lots of time in the sun. Well, Arabs, these Arabs lived in the desert. And so when they refer to her as a, refer to her as a Kushite, it could very well be that they're, she's dark. You married a dark-skinned woman. Not necessarily black, which still plays into the racial issue. Now, us as the Hispanic culture, we get this, right? If we have a little white kid come out, what does Abuelita say? Mi güerito, my little white boy. And if they're unusually dark, what do they say? Mi negrito, oh, my little black boy. 
right? So when they call her, yeah, everybody laughs because that's our culture. That's that. That's what they say. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not a racist anything. That's just, I mean, every every single group I grew up in, there was always somebody named Weddle. So there was always some white boy that was unusually white, you know. And so it was a Weddle, and they embraced the name because they're a white boy, and the rest of us aren't as white. I don't know where I stand, you know. Sometimes I'm light, sometimes I'm dark. It depends. Sometimes I'm red, sometimes I'm olive. I look olive right now. I look more Jewish right now. But, <laughs> you know, but, you know, so she was very dark. And Arabs, well, if you've ever seen Arabs, they can be very dark. And it's likely that Zipporah was unusually dark. Not necessarily that she was black, but dark skinned. And that does play into the racial view. But she's not Ethiopian, she's a Midianite. So when it calls her a Kushite, if, if it's speaking of the adjective of skin color, it's for that reason. Now, the Kushites were descendants of Ham. You guys remember who Ham is? So when the world was basically destroyed, not, let me back up, when the world was literally destroyed, eight persons came off that boat. Noah, his wife, Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. Ham didn't do too well. Ham did something to his dad, and if you guys were with us in the Genesis study, we get into the Hebrew of that context. Ham violated his father to some degree. When it says he saw his father's nakedness, for us, we're like, oh, he saw his wiener. No, no, no. Do you guys remember when we were going through Leviticus what it meant to see your father's nakedness? What was God implying when, whenever that was said? Sexual interaction and it appears that Ham did some kind of sexual interaction to his father when he was passed out drunk. And it says that, the Bible says that when Noah woke up, he knew what his son had did to him. Not what he saw. He knew what his son did to him. And he cursed Ham and his descendants. Now, some of those descendants went into Babylon they were in Babylon, and then they spread down throughout Arabia and through Egypt, which is why Ethiopians may also be Kushites, as well as many of the Arabians or the Arabs. So she very well may be a Kushite by blood, just not an Ethiopian Kushite. The Ethiopians would have likely been black, and the Arabians would have just probably been dark-skinned, but we don't know to what degree. If this is the case... And mind you, they probably left Babel. Do you guys remember why they would have left Babel? Yeah, because God split their languages up. They all built this massive tower called the Tower of Babel. And they were trying to reach heaven. And God came down to look at the puny little tower and struck them. And all their languages were changed. And nobody, they're all babbling. And that's why, it's, that's why we call it Babel. That's where the word Babel comes from. You're babbling. And the nations split up like God told them to. Well, those Cushites went again to Arabia, to Africa. So, this being the case, perhaps her skin color isn't the issue, but rather that Moses married into a woman with a cursed line. The truth is, we are not told why they looked at the Cushite woman and attacked Moses because of her. But I'd be willing to guess that it's the second one more so than the first one. That their issue is that she's a Cushite, she's not an Israelite. And she's of a cursed line, Moses. How could you marry into that? Now, it doesn't say that that's the issue, that that's why, but I would be willing to bet it. So again, this, again it says, Then Miriam, spoke, uh, Mary, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, Has Yahweh indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? So they pull Moses aside and the beseech that they give to him is, has God only spoken to you, Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? Now, it's evident that Arian, uh, Aaron, how's it, Ariam, Aaron and Miriam had the spirit of prophecy, a prophetic spirit. We know that by Exodus chapter 4, uh, 415. When God is calling Moses, Moses, Moses pleads, inadequacy. You remember, oh, I can't speak, Lord. All right, Mo, there's your brother Aaron. He's coming. I'm going to speak to you. You speak to him. He'll speak to Pharaoh. Remember? We all think, I know we watched the movie with Charles, Charles Heston or whatever his name is. 
and Moses is the one with a great voice. And no, in reality, Moses was a weenie, and God said, all right, then you're going to speak to Aaron. Aaron will speak to Pharaoh on your behalf, and you speak on my behalf. And so God would speak to Moses, Moses would take the command down to Aaron, and then Aaron would go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. It was Aaron who did that. And so he's prophetic in the sense that he spoke on behalf of God. That's what prophecy is, to speak forth the word of God. We know that Miriam is a prophetess by Exodus 15.20. When they cross the Red Sea and the river, the sea closes on the Egyptians, remember she sings the song, the song of Miriam. And it says that Miriam the prophetess sang these words and she goes on singing in this prophetic dance and singing. And so we know that Aaron and Miriam both partake of the prophetic spirit. Perhaps they thought since they shared in the gifting that they had a right to share in the leadership as well. Perhaps they thought they had a right to share in the leadership, thinking even maybe I can do better. This is a common theme in church settings. Whenever a pastor may not be working or acting in what we view as adequacy, we start to question the leadership. We start to wonder whether or not this pastor even knows what they're doing. And so they'll challenge the pastor. Well, the Bible says here in verse 2, at the end, Yahweh heard it. They bring a charge against Moses, and Yahweh heard it. Now, verse 3 is one of those quirky verses that pastors, that are, at least the ones that I've known, good Bible teachers, they always make a joke out of, and you'll see why. Verse 3 reads, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. <laughs> Do you know who's writing this book? Moses. <laughs> Moses says of himself, and the man Moses was more humble than anyone on the face of the most humble man who ever lived. It's funny, right? But when we look at this in its original language, humble doesn't necessarily mean what we think it means. There's a much deeper rooted meaning to humble. Yeah, it's a terrible translation. But humble, gentle, meek, what, if, you're, if they say any of those, those are all inadequate translations. Although they can mean that, the true idea behind this word humble in the Hebrew, it means to be, I wrote it down, let me see, I want to make sure I say it right. It means to me to be uh, afflicted and depressed. The Hebrew word anava. Huh? Humbled would be the right type of word. He was humbled. He was brought low. He was depressed. He was afflicted. Remember on the Day of Atonement when they humbled themselves and refrained from food? That affliction. And when they would humble themselves during the, 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 the what is that, stinking feast of unleavened bread? It was a time of humbling and eating without uh, the, the leaven and the good stuff that makes the bread rise. And, and the idea behind it was there was affliction associated with it. And so when it says Moses was humbled more than any man in the world, he's not saying, I'm so humble and full of humility. No, distressed, distraught, depressed, afflicted. Now, why would he be these things? Perhaps in that moment he felt like the lowest man on earth because even his brother and sister were coming against him. You know, Moses has already been tasked with this incredible burden to lead these people. Now, there is a foolish connotation that people have of the ministry where they think it's glory. If you think ministry is glory, you don't know ministry. If you think ministry is glory, then you're not fit for ministry. Ministry is humbling, afflicting, hard, it is not easy, not even a little bit, when you have to deal with things that you should never have to deal with, and yet your hand is forced. Humbling. The hardest part about ministry is often the people that challenge you are the people that love you, that you love. The people closest to you are often the people that challenge you. That is one of the hardest things to deal with in ministry. Leadership is no joke, and the attacks that come are often from the people of our own team. Verse 4. 
Suddenly Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, You three come out to the tent of meeting. So the three of them came out. God calls Moses, God calls Aaron, and God calls Miriam, and he says, come out to the tent of meeting. Now, I'm not sure exactly how this is taken, whether or not they were in a separate location and God's telling them to come to the tent of meeting, or whether or not Moses had come to the tent of meeting, was in the tent of meeting, and then they came in after him and start charging him with these insults, and God tells them to come out and stand in front. I'm not 100% sure what's being said here, but I want you to imagine this. If Miriam and Moses had the gall to walk into that tent of meeting, that is a bold and brazen statement. One person was allowed in that tent that wasn't God. You know who that person was? Mo. That's it. Only Moses. I read some commentaries that said that Joshua was allowed entry, but I went and I looked at the text and it never says that Joshua went in, only that he stood there by the tent as Moses was in. The only person that was supposed to be in that tent was Moses to God and whatever was delivered to Moses was then delivered to the people. And if Moses and Aaron, or I'm sorry, if, if Miriam and Aaron were so brazen so as to walk into that tent with disregard to God, that would be a massive problem. But isn't that what happens when we well up with pride? When we well up with pride, we think we can do things that we have no business doing. And we think that there are no consequences to bear. Because do you know who I am? Ooh, I tell you what, pride, the Bible says, leads to destruction. Pride leads to destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It says pride goes before destruction. Pride, when we think that we can get away with sin, when we think we can do things we have no business doing. Aaron, Miriam, if they did walk in that tent, whew, I'll try that again. Whew, there you go. My lips were dry. <laughs> you know. So God calls them. He says, guys, step out. Now, I don't know about you, but I would be scared. When you're filled with pride, you're blinded by your own ambition. When you're filled with pride, when you're walking in sin, you think people are going to affirm your sin. You think that people are going to jump behind you? God's got my back in this sin. He's got me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm willing to bet that Aaron and Miriam probably weren't that scared. Especially with what God says here in verse 5. But they're probably thinking he's on our side. But I want you to consider this. God never takes our side Ever. God does not take your side and God does not take my side. We take his or we reject him. That's the only option. God doesn't say, well, God took my... No, 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 no. You obey and heed to the things of God or else forsake him. Amen. When I was reading this, when I was studying this, my mind went back to the book of Joshua. Joshua is on the seashore and I believe as they're entering into the land of Canaan and this man appears... We know him as the Lord Jesus Christ incarnate. It's called a Christophany or a Theophany when Jesus appears in human form in the Old Testament. And he appears to Joshua and Joshua thinks he's an enemy. He says, are you with us or are you against us? And the Lord says, no. And then the guy says, take your shoes off your feet now because you stand on holy ground. <gasps> I'll bet you he went, remember what Moses said when Moses stood before the burning bush. So he takes off his feet. It was the angel of the Lord. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. And he bowed before him. But when he charged him, you with us, or you against us? The answer wasn't yes or no. It, was, it wasn't I'm with you or I'm against you. The answer is no. You got it backwards, buddy. Are you on my side or not? Are you going to walk in my commands and statutes or not? The foolish thought of humanity when we think God will take our back. No, 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 no. You decide whether or not you will serve God this day. And if the answer is no, then so be it. Then don't serve God. But if you're going to serve the Lord, then serve the Lord. They think God's on their side. I, again, I, I bet you they think God's about to affirm everything they're saying. They're in the middle of rebuking Moses and God calls, Oh yeah, Moses, you're about to get it now, buddy. And I'll bet you verse 6 further affirms that. Look at verse 6. 
Um, I'm going to read some of verse 5 again. Then Yahweh came down in a pillar of cloud, and he stood at the doorway of the tent, and he called Aaron and Miriam. And when they had both come forward, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, and I'm going to stop there. So God comes, he comes down in the pillar, and he says, If there is a prophet among you, I'll bet you more pride than ever as they well up. Why do you think they welled up with pride? Because they were just telling Moses how they're prophets too. Oh Moses, you're going to get it now. Shame on you. And they probably think that God is really going to take their back. When there's a prophet among you, as excitement probably fills them. God talking about prophets after they just rebuked Moses telling them they're prophets. He says, when there's a prophet among you, I, Yahweh, shall make myself known to him. In a vision, I shall speak with him in a dream. Yeah, that's right. Get him, God. Exalt us to our rightful place, Lord. Now, they're not saying that. It doesn't even say they thought that. But I can imagine, right? Because that's what happens when we're welled up with pride. Man, we entertain the hubris of the mind and we just, we think that somehow we're beyond all logic. We're beyond all reason. We're beyond what God has commanded. That somehow we have exceeded and transcended the commands of God. I've watched this happen in churches, you guys, where people think that they transcend righteousness and they can do what they want. (laughs) Do you know who I am? Well, nobody really gives two craps who you are. Do you know who the Lord is? More importantly, does the Lord know who you are? And if he doesn't, you're in for one hell of a ride. And when I say one hell of a ride, I mean a little train that goes to the pits of hell when you die. Because if the Lord doesn't know you, that's your destination. You know, we have you ever heard somebody say, I know the Lord? So? So what? You know, the Bible never commands that we know the Lord. But the command that the Lord gives on the day of judgment is, I never knew you. That's the command. I don't know you. A lot of us know who the Lord is. Good for you. But if God doesn't know you back, meaning that you have an intimate relationship with God and that your lifestyle reflects who He is, then on the day of judgment, you will stand judged in a way you don't want to be judged. Well, pastor, you're being mean. Well, Jesus said it, not me. The Lord said that those on that day, on the day of judgment, will plead with me, Lord, Lord. They call him Lord twice to emphasize the fact that they believed in him, so to speak. Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And did we not do many good works in your name? This sounds like a Christian, right? And then Jesus is going to look them dead in the face and say, Depart from me, you evil worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And if you're thinking, well, the Bible doesn't say that, write this down. Matthew 7, 21 through like 23. Go read it yourself. Because that is the verse that helped me get sober. (laughs) I try to know that verse. Because that's the verse that God kept throwing in my face when I was trying to quit smoking weed back in the day. And my fear was that, Lord, do you not know me? And it's not his fault. It's because I kept rejecting him. I knew who he was. I knew of his fame, of his magnitude. I knew of his magnificence and his glory. But did he know me because I had a relationship with him? Was I being transformed by the renewing of my mind because of the washing of the water of his word in my soul? Here these two are, welled up with pride, probably think God's about to back them. And in my mind, I picture them with smug looks on their face. There's nothing more beautiful when somebody has a smug look and it gets wiped off. That's one of the most satisfying things for me. (laughs) Standing there all smug face and whack, you get smacked and that smug face is gone. So God tells him, I, Yahweh, shall make myself known to that prophet in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. And then verse 7, this is the part that wipes the smug face off. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. He says, guys, when I come to a prophet, I speak in a dream. I I speak in a vision. I say, 
he, he's going to say here in a moment in dark sayings. He says, but when it comes to my servant Mo, he walks in there and he beholds me in a manifested form. Not God in his glory because Moses can't handle that. We saw that in previous chapters, in Exodus actually. But he, Moses beholds a manifestation of God, whatever that manifestation was. But God says, he speaks to me face to face, mouth to mouth as one speaks to another person. He says, I don't come to Moses in some dream or some vision. Yeah, that right there should be enough to shake anybody. At that point, you know you're, you know you're, uh, it's like if you ever watch those Italian mafia movies where, you know, they don't know they're about to get whacked and then they realize at the last moment. That's right here, you know, they probably thought everything was going well and it's like, ah, uh, yep, we messed up. Whoops. Verse 8, he says, With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of Yahweh. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? God tells them straight up, mouth to mouth and openly, he beholds my form. The form of Yahweh is literally what he says. In the way that I manifest myself to him again, not in his glory. But he gives them this charge, this rebuke. Why were you not afraid to speak against him? Why were you not afraid to speak against him? There is a real principle here, and we see it in the life of David, that we are to be careful when speaking against Yahweh's anointed. When God anoints somebody, be careful when you speak against them. I'm not saying you can't speak against them. Be careful when you speak against them. There is an appropriate time when an anointed should be rebuked. It just depends on what they're doing. You know, if there's an anointed man doing some wicked deed, rebuke him. If he, you see him at the bar getting plastered, rebuke him. You see him cheating on his wife, rebuke him. You see him beating somebody senseless on the street, rebuke him. You see him manipulating people, rebuke him. But if a man of God, a man anointed by God, and it's an evident anointing, is well within the will of God, be so careful so as to walk in rebuke towards that person. Because what you will find is what happens here, is you're not really challenging that person. You know who you're challenging? You're challenging the Lord. You're challenging His decision. You're challenging His anointed. That'd be like if you came to my kid and beat them. What do you think is going to happen to you? I'm probably going to jail. Now, I don't care if you smack my kid in the head if he's messing up. Within reason. You know, he's got a little whack. Nothing is going to hurt him, but make sure he knows, hey, you can't be doing that. I'll back anybody up. If my kid's messing up and you whack him in the back of the head, that's cool. But if you slap my kid in the face, I'll put your face through the wall. I can do it, I promise you. You might not think I can, but I can. Because that's my son. When we are anointed by the Lord, when one is anointed and they're walking with that, that anointing and you challenge that, you don't challenge the person, you challenge the Lord. You challenge God's decision. Who called Moses? Moses didn't even want the job. Right? Moses says, Lord, pick somebody else. God says, I chose you, bro. You're going to do this. Okay, I'll do it, Lord. Since Aaron's going to speak on my, my behalf, I'll do it. Moses was picked by God to say that he's a mistake is to look God in the face and give him the bird. That is a scary place to be. And you know what God does? He takes that personally. So he calls them and now he challenges them. He says, were you not afraid to speak against him? Again, we want to be careful when speaking against Yahweh's anointed. Not saying not to, but being careful. There was once, I'm going to give you two examples. My old pastor used to really uphold this, where you can never speak against the authority. And I don't agree with that. I believe when an authority is out of line, that we should have the right to rebuke them. Now, Paul gives the charge that we should rebuke somebody in such a position carefully. And the rebuke should always be from a place of love. It should never be a harsh attack. There's nothing wrong with being rebuked. I've been rebuked. I don't mind being rebuked as long as I'm wrong. That's cool. But if you rebuke me and you're wrong, I'll let you know. Like, well, I don't agree with you that you did. I don't really care. 
<laughs> I'm like, well, what did I do first? Well, well, dude, come on. You got to put your big boy pants on. Come on. This isn't the 60s when, you were, when we talk all weenie anymore. We got to be straight with people. Even the old people seem to like it. You know what I mean? I always get worried when I say certain things because I'm like, the old people are going to get freaked out. They're the ones that come up, oh, that was such a good teaching. You know, I'm like, well, good. You know, then I didn't offend you too much. Right on. You know, and the goal isn't to be offensive, but the goal is to be straight. To the point. And to not hide things. Because I hate that when the church churches stuff up. We take matters that are issues and we make them not so big because, well, yeah, I don't want to offend anybody. No, look, the gospel is offensive. The gospel is particularly offensive if you're living in sin. But I don't want to be offended. Well, repent. You know, yeah, that's what Jesus said. Repent. Repent and follow me was his command. So my pastor used to take that stance that you were never, you should never challenge an authority. And I don't agree with that. I just think that the challenge has to be adequate. But then there was this time on Facebook where somebody was talking about Joel Steen and this lady hopped on and says, you should not rebuke the, no, the Lord's anointed. You should not, you know, come against the Lord's anointed. And she was quoting David because that's what David did. You know, Saul was whacked out. But Saul was chosen by God, handpicked like Moses. The difference between Joel Olstein and, you know, um, Saul was Saul was handpicked. Was Joel Olstein handpicked? I don't know, and I don't believe he was. I'm going to tell you my biggest issue with Joel Olstein, and I don't care if you li- don't like it. Then too bad. Because you know, for a long time I was very gracious with him, but then he said something that I could not let go. On live TV, he said, "I don't know if I can say Jesus is the only way." At that point, I said, "You are a heretic, dog." And you are not of us. You came from us, but you ain't of us, in the words of John the Apostle. Why would I say that? Because that's scripture. Jesus, in his own lips and words and tongue and voice, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. That's clear, that's cut, that's concise, that is absolutely exclusive. I don't know if I can say, then you ain't a preacher. Dog. You need to get off that pulpit and stop preaching to people. This is what I've learned about Joel Osteen. He's not a preacher. He's not even a pastor. He's a motivational speaker. Yes. But he has no business motivationally speaking in a church, in the pastor's position. But the girl's like, you can't speak against the Lord tonight. Did? I said, this fool's a heretic. <laughs> Amen. There does come a point where we draw a line in the sand and say, that's enough. That is enough. So there is a time when we do speak out against what we would call the Lord's anointed. So don't ever misconstrue that. You know, again, if the Lord's anointed is messing up, we call out the Lord's anointed, but it should be done in grace. And the whole idea behind rebuke should never be to embarrass. It should never be to to, to belittle, but it should be to correct. It should be to restore, to rebuild. Yeah, In verse 9 it says, So the anger of Yahweh burned against them, and he departed. Now we saw this phrase last week. Remember when God got furious with the children of Israel? They're crying because of God's provision. Oh God, all we have is this manna. Remember what manna was like? Remember those root words, crispo, cremo? Nah, that's not the word. But it's basically crispy creams, man. Like coriander seed mixed with honey when it was baked. Dude, ma- imagine getting Krispy Kreme donuts from heaven that don't rot your teeth, that fill you up, and then you're crying to God, oh, all we have to eat is Krispy Kremes. And they're good for you. They're healthy. It's food from heaven. And they start crying, and they actually cry to the point where they rebuke God they reject God by saying, oh, that we would go back to Egypt, back into slavery, where we had free melons, free fish, free garlic, free leeks, free something else too. What is it? Cucumbers. They had a couple free things, 
And that, that was really where their mind was set. I want to go back to slavery so I can get some free stuff. When they weren't looking forward to God was about to bless them with the promised land that was going to be filled with milk and honey. Well, that, it's not necessarily milk and honey, that's, but the idea is it's going to be rich in nutrient, prosperous is the idea. Lots of milk and honey too, but the idea behind milk and honey is prosperous. And so they were looking backwards instead of forwards to God's provision. So God says, I'll give you meat to eat. And remember, I'm not going to get into the whole story, but essentially while they're eating their meat, the Bible says the anger of the Lord burned and he struck them with a plague and a bunch of them died. Well, here it says again, the anger of Yahweh burned. Again, the Hebrew language is extraordinarily pictorial. The idea behind the anger of Yahweh burning is his face became red hot and his nostrils flared. <sighs> you know, I, can't, I can't make that. I probably look stupid just now. But if, you know, the idea is that my face should have turned, I'm not really mad. So, but red, hot, big nostrils. Angry. The anger of Yahweh burned. Now, it says the anger of Yahweh burned against them and he departed. Now, we're not told exactly what that looked like. I'm going to go ahead and imagine immense dread coming upon Aaron and Miriam. You ever been in a moment where dread comes upon you in an unusual fashion? And like you're gripped with fear and you might not even fully know why, but you just know something's not right. Your stomach starts turning, you get the bubble guts. All of a sudden you need the toilet. And it's like, I'm going to imagine that they were probably struck with fear at this moment. In verse 10 it says, But when the cloud had withdrawn from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam. Behold, she was leprous. Miriam became leprous instantly. Now, I meant to look it up and I forgot, but only Miriam is struck here and it's not Aaron. It appears Miriam was the leader of this escapade. It appears that she was the one that was springboarding it. She was spearheaded it. And that's perhaps why she was the only one that was struck. But Aaron joined. I think he should have got struck too. But he didn't. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take one massive guess as why God spared Aaron. Just a guess, and I think this is the answer. Aaron is the high priest. And he has specific duties that he has to uphold. And I'm willing to bet that for God's sake, for his holiness sake, he spares Aaron so that Aaron can maintain the tabernacle because Aaron was given specific jobs like the candelabras were to be lit, make, maintain being lit. The morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice had to be done every single day. And so I'm willing to bet that God spared him only for that purpose because of his unique call. Miriam, however, she got struck with leprosy. Now, we've only seen this happen one of uh, two, we've only seen this happen two times in Scripture, and this is one of those two where somebody immediately is struck with leprosy. And in both instances, it comes from a place of incredible irreverence towards God. So here, when Miriam speaks against Moses, she defies God because God put Moses in this role. The other time we see this is with King Uzziah, who was a righteous king for a good portion of his life. And in the latter years of his life, you know what happens to most people who end up, you know, full of themselves? Pride feeling. Pride just takes over. Now, kings had a very limited job. Kings had to maintain the governance of the land uh, monocratically. Monarchy, monocratic, monocratic, I don't know if that's the right word. As monarchs. They were never allowed to associate in the role of a priest, ever. As a matter of fact, God makes a clear distinction that kings can't be priests because the kings must come from the line of Judah. Priests can never be a king either because the priest comes from the line of Levi. There's only one person who could be king and priest, but they supersede the line of Judah and they're a king after, and a priest after the order of Melchizedek, not the Judea, not the Israeli functioning priest and king, but a much higher order. In Hebrews, we're going to start Hebrew Sunday and we're going to talk about these things because the Bible covers them. But otherwise, within the function of the Israeli people, the people from Judah, a specific line, the line of David, they could be kings and the people of the line of Levi, they could be priests, period. Well, King Uzziah, filled with pride, takes incense and goes and burns it before God in the temple. 
That's a big no-no. That is about as irreverent to God as you can be. That's looking God in the face and saying, your way sucks. I do it my way. I'm going to burn incense to you whether you like it or not. And the Bible says the second Uzziah burned the incense, he was struck with leprosy immediately. And the priest rushed him out of the temple. And he freaks out. He starts repenting. Too late, bro. And the Bible tells us that Uzziah remained a leper until the day of, day of his death. You can find that in 2 Chronicles uh, 26, 16. But his pride overtook, and his pride led to irreverence toward God to a degree in which God struck him. So Miriam, she gets struck also, and both instances are marked with great irreverence towards the Lord, towards Yahweh. In verse 11, Then Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, I beg you, do not account the sin to us in which we have acted foolishly and in which we have sinned. Oh my Lord. Now I want you to notice what Aaron does. Aaron learned his place extraordinarily quickly. Who did he appeal to? Moses. He said to Moses, Oh my Lord. But I want to make this note. Aaron's repentance is directed in the wrong direction. The, who Aaron truly offended was God. Realize when we're in sin, you know who the first person we offend is? God. When we are in sin, the first thing we do is we need to get right with God. Then we can get right with the person we've transgressed. But when we sin, it's not like if I smacked Kurt or did something. Uh, let's say I did something that Kurt didn't know I did to him. <laughs> I got him. And then it comes to light. If I just come to Kurt and say, I'm sorry, Kurt. That's corny repentance. Because I have not acknowledged before God my wrong. Ultimately, I broke his, let's say I stole something from him. Whose command did I break? Hmm. So who have I sinned against first? Now I owe Kurt. <laughs> now I owe Kurt repentance. So although Aaron directing to Moses in repentance, there, there, there gives a weight of legitimacy to Moses' stance now. Now Moses is being upheld in Aaron's eyes in the rightful place that was, he was put in by God, right? But again, Aaron's repentance was misguided, although not necessarily incorrect because he challenged God first and foremost. Verse 12 says, Oh, do not let her be like one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes from his mother's womb. Do not let her be like one dead. Aaron is pleading with Moses to pray for them. Now, Aaron's plea to Moses makes sense in this, in that God wasn't accessible in the way he's accessible today. So today as Christians, we can go to God immediately because of the blood of Christ, because the veil has been removed. God is, the Lord Jesus has made an open door between us and the Father where we can come in repentance immediately anywhere. We don't have to travel to Jerusalem, take a lamb, sacrifice, do the whole ritualistic sacrifice that God commanded. No, that's, that's done with. Jesus fulfilled that. And in his name, in his blood, we can come before the Father at any point in time ever. The moment you're ready to repent, God's ready to accept it so long as your repentance is genuine and in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. In this day, they didn't have that option. And so perhaps Aaron is pleading with Moses because Moses is that mediator now between Aaron and the Father and God. And he asks, don't let her be like one dead. That's his plea. So again, in this plea to Moses, he establishes and recognizes Moses' unique relationship with God. Aaron knew he couldn't go before God, so he pleads to the one who can. Now I find it interesting that Aaron reacts, but Miriam doesn't. Or Miriam's reaction isn't recorded for us, whether she did or not. It's not recorded. And I don't know why that is, but you know she had to be filled with fear. You know that she was filled with panic. Well, maybe. Well, let me explain to you. Leprosy is one of two things. The leprosy that the Bible talks about is either a lost form of disease that we're not 100% sure about, or it's Hansen's disease. Today, many recognize it as Hansen's disease. But I want you to picture it being uh, what they explain it to be in the scriptures. It's a degenerative type disease where limbs decay. Yeah, you literally start decaying and your skin just starts to rot away. And if it's Hansen's disease, what happens is you lose filling. 
And what happens is if you lose feeling, you lose the ability to gauge pressure. So you might have your hand on a really hot rock leaning on a fire, and you don't even know it. Psst, it's just burning. Oh, crap. What is and then infections happens and oozing. And, and so it's very possible that it, it's one of, it could be one of the two. I don't know which one it is. Today they recognize it as Hansen's disease, which it very well may be. We are walking and you can't feel. So if you're stubbed your toe and you're bleeding all over the place and you're, you don't know. You, you never walk like next to a branch and it scrapes you and your skin rips open. I'm like, you don't know. And so your body is literally in a decaying fashion because you're getting all these cuts, bruises, burns, and you can't feel. So it's very possible that it's that. So she might not even feel, she might not even fully know, and they start freaking out. She starts freaking out, panicking. <gasps> she turned white as snow, the Bible says. And in verse 13, it says, Moses cried out to Yahweh saying, Oh God, heal her, I pray. Now I love this because we see a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ here. What did Jesus tell us to do? Pray for our enemies. Pray for those who spitefully persecute you. She was just in the middle of rebuking him and calling him out and talking trash about his wife. Now she's leprous and Moses is interceding on her behalf. That's one of the hardest points of Christianity, to love people who are doing the most atrocious things, especially when it's to you. But that is one of the greatest exemplifications of Christianity. So Moses intercedes. He could have, you know what Moses could have done? Which I, would, I probably would have done. Because they didn't have the Spirit of God then. And if I didn't have the Spirit of God, this would be like 90% of my prayers. They're called imprecatory prayers. You know what imprecatory prayers are? Lord, smite them. Break their teeth out of their mouth, shatter their bones. Crush them to dust take their life. David prays these in the Psalms to some of his enemies. These are real. You know, I do pray these sometimes. When somebody is living in sin and they're unrepentant and they're acting in wickedness, I'll ask God, smash the crap out of them. I pray that you would destroy their life and you would smash them to smithereens and bring them to repentance. Imprecatory prayers. I do pray them. I would rather not pray them. But again, when somebody is in a place where they're just, I'll pray them. And my hope is always that God hears my prayer. <laughs> you know, that's messed up. Is it though? Is it because, you know what, when we're smashed to smithereens, you know what people typically do? They repent and return to the Lord. Well, I'm not going to your church. I'm going to any church. I don't care. But repent and come back to the Lord. Repent and come back to God. Imprecatory prayers. Moses didn't do that. That should never be our first avenue. Our first avenue should be like Moses' attitude here. Lord, heal her, I pray. Lord, heal her. He pleads with God for his sister Mary for mercy. Verse 14, But Yahweh said to Moses, If her father but spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut up for seven days outside the camp and afterward she may be received again. So God tells Moses, as Moses is pleading with him, Lord, heal her. God says, you know, I hear you, Moses, but I'm not letting her off that easy. The idea here when God says, if her father had but spit in her face, this was a com not common, this is actually uncommon, but more common in the Middle East, that when a child was an aggressor to such degrees that the parent was at the max annoyance, and they were at the max, what it says he was the word I wrote, provocation is the word I wrote. When they were provoked to this degree, a father would spit in the daughter's face. And she would be considered unclean and she'd be removed from the camp for seven days. I mean, this isn't something that just happened. This is something that builds. This is, again, the greatest form of provocation in a family to spit on one's face. It's the deepest form of contempt. This is the comparison that God gives us to what Mary did. That she provoked him so much that it's like if a father spit in her face. He says, if a father had but spit in her face, would she not be excluded for seven days? And he says, let her go outside of the camp and bear her guilt, bear her shame for seven days. Let her go think about what she's done. Woo! <laughs> 
That's pretty gnarly is what that is. You know, we think that God does not see our sin. We think that God doesn't hear our sin. He does. You know, one of the things that scares me more than anything is God is with you when you do them. That's the scariest thing, you guys. When we are in sin, God is with us. That is why the Apostle Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit who is within you. Do you know that when you join yourself in sex with somebody that's not your spouse, God is there and you're joining yourself in a prostitute fashion, worshiping demons, the Bible says. When you're doing drugs and drinking, God is with you as you tie those, those, those demons to yourself. Did you know that? When we live and act in wickedness, the Lord doesn't just depart from us. As the Christian lives, he indwells us. And we take and mar the face of God more so than we did when we're, I mean, at least in the world when we're living in sin, you were just being worldly. But when we bear the name Christ, we smear his name through the mud and we bring him low. How do I know that he's with us? Because he said he'd never leave us. He had never forsake us. And when the New Testament talks about the indwelling of the Spirit, Paul calls it a seal. Now, if you don't understand how a Roman seal worked, then you don't understand how the Spirit of God can never depart from you if you're born again. The way a Roman seal worked is once that seal was put in play, it was immovable. So when Paul mentions that we're sealed with the Spirit of promise, Every person of the Roman world understood that. It is an unbreakable, an unmovable action. Cannot be undone. It's so set in stone, it can so be undone that we are called children of God. All right, you got kids right here, right? Could your kids ever do something that makes them not your kids anymore? What if they did really, really bad things? How about anybody with kids, right? Would anybody, you would? Oh, she's like, I did so much. <laughs> you know, if you have children, it doesn't matter. They could do the most atrocious things. Even if you disowned them, they're still yours. When God calls us his own in that nature, it cannot be undone. To further understand that, you have to understand a Roman adoption. The Roman adoption was of the highest order. Something that was irrevocable. So when we are born again, Paul puts these types of images on our salvation. Irremovable, irrevocable of the highest order. We've been given the right to be called children of God. We can cry out, Abba, Father. And so when we walk and live in sin, we drag him through the mud with us. They deserve some spit in the face and kicked out the camp. <laughs> Verse 15 and 16, we close this chapter out. So Miriam was shut up outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until Miriam was received again. Afterward, however, the people moved out from Hazarot and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Now, she was removed for seven days, and they didn't move till she came back in. And so she was effectively restored. God heard the cry of Moses, but there was still a penalty for her sin. Don't ever think that we can live in sin and then God's not going to judge us. Here's the scary part about sin. God's wills of judgment turn slowly but thoroughly. What does that mean? It means the effects of our sin might not play out immediately because I believe God is graciously trying to draw us back. But when we don't repent, when God's gears crush in his judgment, they're thorough. I have been crushed by the judgment of God because of sin in my life. And I'm here to tell you it's not worth it. I've shared with you guys 2013, the darkest year of my life, the year that I almost killed myself several times. Dark year. Best year also because I got my crap together with God. I got real in my walk. I mean, I was real in my walk, but I learned what grace was. I, I learned how to let go of the pride, and I learned how to let God truly live through me. Not that I don't still have issues or faults. But that ultimately came because I was so welled up with pride. And when God's gears of judgment crushed me, it was the most thorough crushing I've ever experienced. And if you want to know just how thorough it was, talk to my wife. Because she'll tell you that I went in one way and I came out another. 
Miriam, her name literally means rebellion. And this day she lived up to her name. She rebelled. And don't ever forget that rebellion is ultimately always against God. It doesn't matter how we act or interact in society. When we live in sin, it's always against the Lord. And the Lord does not take kindly to it. But there's hope. Miriam didn't go out as a leper. Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. God had an incredible amount of mercy on Miriam. She, he heeded the prayers of Moses for his sister. And she was restored back to the camp. Until Jesus comes, and other than, than Naaman, the Assyrian, you don't hear about people getting cured of leprosy in the scriptures. It just didn't happen. You got Miriam, you got Naaman, and then you got the people in the New Testament under Christ. Outside of that, it just did not happen. Because it was a degenerative disease that lived out its course until you died, essentially. Oh. Crazy chapter, huh? <laughs> Father, we thank you for being God and we thank you for your faithfulness, for your mercy and grace. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we go forward into this evening and into this coming weekend, that you would be with us, you'd direct us, guide us, and lead us in all your ways. Fill us with your holy presence, Lord, that we would walk in your ways, that we'd walk in obedience to you. Help us to love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Help us to do what is right because you are worthy, Father. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for dying for our sins in Jesus' name. Amen.